Need me to do something? No, I was just needing to get the recording started. So uh, I think I've got it going now. Uh, folks, we want to welcome you to the, the Mountain Zoom series on pollinators tonight. Um, these are hosted by Phil Meeks out of Wise County, Virginia, Jeremy Williams out of Harlan County, Kentucky, and uh, I'm Shad Baker out of Letcher County, Kentucky. And uh, the presentation tonight is uh, a borrowed presentation from the U.S. Forest Service, and um, I've, I've got several different pollinator talks, but this was an, a unique one uh, and new to me, so I, I thought I would uh, start with it. Um, if you've got any questions that pop up along the way, feel free to enter those in the chat box. And um, if you don't mind muting yourself uh, while this is going on so that uh, we don't, occasionally we have kids or something that goes running through or dogs that bark, uh, we appreciate that. Um, so I guess uh, first things first, uh, what is pollination? Um, Pollination is uh, simply the movement of pollen. Uh, it's, it's the male genetic material from one flower to another of the same species. And it's necessary for the production of seeds and fruits. And the benefit of it is that it helps ensure genetic uh, variability uh, that's really vital to healthy plant populations. And if you think about it, plants can be pollinated in really only a handful of ways, uh, wind, water, or through the action of insects and animals. Uh, plants that are pollinated uh, primarily by wind produce small grains of pollen that can be easily carried um, long distances through the air. And because of the movement of the pollen from one flower to another uh, by wind, uh, because that's somewhat uh, haphazard, uh, wind pollinated plants <coughs> usually produce a lot of really small pollen grains that can be easily carried and if you think about the, the pollen that you see on your car uh, in the, the spring, oak trees, grasses, uh, those kinds of things, it's that yellowish uh, dust that gets all over everything. And the flowers that produce those are not really designed to attract anything uh, because it's, it's wind pollinated. So um, they tend to be pretty small and, and drab, green. They don't have those um, stark colors uh, that we think of when we think of flowers. And uh, you know, if you think of ragweed, if it wasn't for the fact that it made you sneeze, uh, nobody um, uh, even, let me put it this way, uh, even without it making you sneeze, nobody's ever gonna plant ragweed because of the, the beauty of the flower. Most people hardly notice it. And in contrast to that, animal pollinated plants have a uh, symbiotic relationship uh, with the, the insects or the animals that, that do the pollination. And the plants provide some necessary, uh, necessary resource that and it's usually food in the form of nectar or the pollen itself. And in the process of collecting that uh, pollen, the animal uh, pollinates uh, from flower to flower. So the flower, uh, the plant gets a, a benefit from it uh, and so does the insect or the animal. Um, animal pollinated flowers uh, usually advertise themselves. So uh, think of kind of a marketing uh, scheme like you would see on a billboard. Uh, that's essentially what a, a colorful flower is, is a billboard for a, a plant. And <clears throat> the purpose of that is to, through color or shape or the scent, uh, to attract uh, the pollinators that they need. And uh, they have, uh, you can't see it, but they actually, a lot of them have ultraviolet uh, guides that kind of point the insects towards the center of the flower uh, where the, uh, the nectar or the pollen is. And, um, and the, the insects can see those things. So it's kind of like a, a picture of a runway um, with the lights that kind of uh, flash towards the middle uh, so that they know where to go to. So before we go to the next slide, I want to uh, do a little survey. If you could uh, go down to the chat box, um, depending on how your Zoom is set up, it should either be at the top of the screen or the main bottom of the screen, but there should be a chat box uh, somewhere in there. And uh, I'll just type, hey, so you can uh, see that pop up, hopefully. But 
uh, tell me other than an insect, um, an animal pollinator, if you can think of an animal uh, that pollinates flowers. Oh, very good. Uh, bats, definitely, and uh, humans uh, definitely can. Um, are there any birds that do this? Okay, hummingbirds, very good. Somebody got it. So uh, those are some easy ones just right off the top. There's actually mammals uh, that also pollinate uh, flowers. So it, it's not limited uh, to, to insects and uh, um, you know, butterflies, that kind of thing. It, it actually is a, a lot of different uh, species that do this. Uh, so let me advance the slide now if I can. I'm trying to do a lot of fancy things here tonight and I'm not uh, altogether used to doing it. So we've got uh, birds. Uh, this is a little Rufus uh, hummingbird on the right, uh, but bats, and a lot of different types of insects. And, you know, we, we almost always think of bees and uh, butterflies. Uh, sometimes if you're an entomologist type, you might think of uh, the moths, but there are also uh, lots of flies. Uh, if you think of a pawpaw tree, um, it, its flowers are kind of uh, discreet. Um, they're kind of a deep maroon and they don't stand out very much but they attract carrion flies. And uh, those carrion flies are what pollinates the pawpaw trees. And uh, one of the ways I've heard of people trying to increase the pollination is to, to uh, put uh, roadkill or uh, rancid smelling pieces of meat uh, in the tree to attract more carrion flies. And uh, I guess if pawpaws are your gig, uh, that might be something you want to try, but uh, I don't necessarily recommend that, um, but beetles and even some wasps uh, can, can be pollinators. So as far as the importance of pollinators, um, over 75% of our flowering plants depend on animal pollinators. And in the US, there's over 100 uh, crop plants that depend on animal pollinators and the value of the crops that they produce exceeds $15 billion. So if you think about it in terms of money, uh, they're extremely important to us. Uh, if you're interested in eating and I guess having a, a diverse uh, diet, uh, they become very important for that reason. Um, but we've also got natural ecosystems that would totally collapse if we didn't have those animal pollinators. And so a lot of the, the plants that we see, uh, uh, you know, beautiful flowers and things that make life uh, more interesting, in the absence of those pollinators, uh, the world would be a very drab uh, place. I don't know if, if any of you would admit to watching the B movie, the cartoon, but uh, they kind of hit on that uh, point. Um, some of the, the facts that they provide in the movie are not uh, legit, but uh, it's, it's an interesting movie and they do actually make some valid points as far as the importance of, of bees and pollinators. But we've got some plants that are actually endangered uh, because the, the main pollinators that they depend on are in decline. And, uh, you know, it's some of our more unusual uh, things. Um, and if you're a chocolate lover, and, and I am, and my wife definitely is, uh, there could be no chocolate uh, without the pollinators. And so <clears throat> uh, that, that's really, really important. But um, we, we think about grains uh, for food, uh, but and those are um, definitely wind pollinated, but uh, tree fruits like apples and peaches and oranges, tomatoes, berries, uh, some of our spicy foods like chili peppers, uh, all of those, uh, if you like salsa, Mexican food, uh, you need pollinators. Um, and I guess uh, there's a lot of Indian dishes that are really, really spicy and those depend on pollinators. Um, uh, let's see what else. I think I've hit on, on most of what I wanted to hit on that. Um, as far as the chocolate goes, you might be curious, uh, that's a little midge fly that actually pollinates the, the chocolate. Uh, so there's your extra credit for tonight. So what makes a good pollinator? It needs to be highly mobile. 
Uh, you know, flowers are needing the pollinator to go from one flower to another. And in certain circumstances, those flowers might be uh, a fair distance apart from one another. So the, the thing that's gonna be doing the pollination needs to be able to travel. And typically that means that it can fly and uh, so that's the flies, the butterflies, the, the beetles, uh, the, those kinds of things, honeybees. Um, and the, the pollen needs to be able to attach to it. So if it's got hairs or scales or feathers or something like that, um, you know, sometimes uh, some of the mammals have like um, fuzzy whiskers here around their nose. Those are the things that, that catch the pollen. And when they move on to the next flower, uh, that's how it gets pollinated. They need to be adapted to feeding on uh, flowers, nectar, and pollen. So, uh, you know, not just any, um, not just any insect is going to uh, meet these criteria. Um, a lot of times they have to have specialized feeding structures. You know, some of the trumpet-shaped flowers can be really, really deep. And so, the, the things that pollinate them have to either be able to burrow down into that trumpet flower or they have to have a, a tongue uh, or a, a proboscis or something that is capable of going down in that flower and uh, uh, reaching the, the nectar source and being able to uh, shake the pollen loose. Um, some of them have, uh, the, and that's the specialized feeding structures, I guess. It, um, it also needs to visit a limited number of plant species. So if it's a bee that just goes willy nilly to every flower uh, that it sees, um, it, it won't necessarily be very efficient of moving the pollen from one flower to the pollen of that same species. So that's one of the things that makes honeybees uh, such a great thing is that they tend to want to work out one type of flower at a time. And uh, if you've ever keep, kept bees before, um, you know that when uh, clover is in bloom, even though there may be other things that they would normally work, uh, they tend to want to work just on the clover. And when the maples are in bloom, they work just on the maple. And by doing that, they actually, uh, that, that supercharges their ability to, to pollinate. So we're going to hit on some of the pollinators uh, that uh, that are really good. Uh, this first one is uh, a bat, of course, and uh, you can see he's got a lot of uh, fuzz there around his uh, muzzle and uh, maybe even a, a unique little appendage there on his nose. And while most bats feed exclusively on flying insects, some species are adapted to feeding on nectar. And so the, the lesser long-nosed bat, which is what you're seeing here, uh, that is native to Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico. Um, it, it is particularly important in pollinating uh, agave and cactus plants. And it, it's got that long muzzle and it's got a tongue that can reach uh, down in the flower for the, the nectar and pollen. So uh, it makes it really uh, well suited uh, to that particular uh, group of plants. Here we have a, a hummingbird and uh, hummingbirds are the most common of the bird pollinators. Um, in the United States, hummingbird diversity is the highest in the Southwest. Um, here in the East, all we have is the ruby-throated uh, hummingbird. But if you look at a, a birder's guide for the Southwestern US, uh, they've got actually several different kinds of hummingbird in that part of the country. And um, so, They'll feed on a lot of uh, flowers with a wide variety of shapes and colors, uh, not just the tubular and red, but they do prefer those larger uh, showy flowers uh, with lots of nectar. And so, um, uh, you know, anything that's trumpet shaped tends to favor, uh, or the, the hummingbird is especially good. This is a cardinal flower uh, that blooms in the late summer and uh, if you think about like the jewel weed that we have, if you've ever looked at the flower of it, 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 it would have to have, um, the pollinator for those would have to have a longer tongue to be able to reach uh, the nectar. So there are other bird pollinators uh, in the US. Uh, there's a, a bird called the honey creeper uh, in Hawaii, and they're really, really important for pollinating uh, some local plants there in Hawaii. 
The next one, I, I think everybody recognizes that bees are kind of the workhorse of the pollination world. And this is because uh, they, they are almost exclusively attracted to flowers. Uh, you know, hummingbirds will feed on other things. They, uh, um, they feed on spiders and, and various other insects. And the same is true with some of the bats and, and the mammals. But bees are pretty uh, specialized uh, towards flowers. And uh, they're highly mobile. They've got a lot of hair on them that the pollen sticks to. And um, they're adapted to feeding on nectar and pollen. And uh, they've even got, uh, in a lot of instances, they've got specialized uh, structures on their legs. If you've ever paid attention to a honeybee, they've got those little pollen baskets um, that are on their, their legs. And if you're a beekeeper, a lot of times you identify what they are working based on the color of the pollen that's on their legs. And so, uh, you know, sometimes you see them and it's a real, real drab, plain, um, or, or kind of a buttery yellow pollen. And other times it's like school bus uh, orange. So um, you can uh, kind of keep an eye out for that. <clears throat> there, this is a bumblebee here that we're looking at. And it, it, you can see the, the, I don't know if you're seeing the cursor or not, but you can see uh, the pollen attached to his legs or her legs rather. Um, and um, again, they've got lots of hair on them that, that helps with that. Um, now we've got, uh, and this is another picture that, that shows those pollen sacs really, really well. Um, some bees are uh, social, uh, like honeybees uh, that you see here, and, uh, and bumblebees are social. Uh, and what this means is rather than being solitary bees, and we do have a lot of varieties of solitary bees, uh, these bees live in colonies. And so there's kind of a hierarchy uh, uh, or um, a specialization of tasks. So, you know, in this uh, colony system, there's a queen, uh, there's worker bees, uh, there's drones, uh, there's tending bees, and uh, all of these bees um, are uh, distinguished either by their gender, so the, the drones would be the males, and um, th they used to get a bad rap. People thought that all they really did was uh, mate with the queen, and after that they were a drain on the colony. Uh, but over time they found that if there are not enough drones in the hive, that the hive actually gets demoralized, and they, they don't work as well. So there is something else going on there. We're not sure exactly what that is. Uh, Phil or, or Jeremy might know more about that than I do, but um, apparently there's a pheromone involved or something that they're providing that causes the, the rest of the colony to feel like life is worth living. And uh, my wife isn't here right now, so I can say that maybe hopefully she feels that way towards me, that um, <laughs> having us around is a good thing. Um, but uh, here is a, a bumblebee, and there's a lot of different kinds of bumblebees. Some of these are um, uh, endangered, um, and I don't know if the presentation gets into any of these, but this is a western bumblebee, um, and uh, I'll just skip through some of these. Here's another one that's got the pollen on its legs. Um, now this one is a, a solitary bee, and um, these bees live by themselves. They uh, start a colony on their own, and they're the only one that comes and feeds their larvae. And um, this uh, particular one is a sweat bee. And uh, a lot of these are metallic green or blue. Some of them are actually very, very pretty. Um, I've, I've seen some in the, the green and the blue green uh, colors that uh, honestly would, if, if you were kind of uh, different, um, they would make pretty decorations in a house. Um, they're just some of the prettiest insects you'll ever see. Um, I know some people hate them because they, they flock into you when you're outside. And uh, uh, if you're allergic to bees, some people have a really serious allergic reaction uh, to sweat bees. Um, but they, they usually don't feel as painful as, as the regular honeybees or wasp do. It's, it's a smaller sting but uh, they're also very important pollinators. 
This next one, uh, you can see the metallic on this one. Uh, this is a, a mason bee, uh, or, um, but there, there's uh, a mason bee, the blueberry or uh, blue orchard bee are uh, different names for it. But these bees are important pollinators of fruit. Um, they use clay to seal their nest holes and uh, mason bees and leaf cutting bees are members of uh, the same uh, family, uh, which uh, I would try to pronounce, but I hurt myself. Um, but if you, uh, I don't know if, if you've ever gotten into this or not, but you can uh, put up the little bamboo um, bundles uh, in your garden. And uh, sometimes folks will take a piece of a block of wood and they will drill a lot of different holes of a pretty small diameter, like the size of a pencil. And uh, mason bees are the ones that will come and lay their eggs in it and they, they pack it with pollen and then mud. And uh, if you're lucky, you get to see the larvae emerge uh, out of those tubes. Uh, but they are very, very important pollinators. Um, I've got blueberries here in my yard and I see this particular bee uh, working those a lot. This next one is uh, really common. It's a leaf cutter bee. It's another solitary bee. And uh, they're called leaf cutters because they line the cells of their nest with leaves that they cut out with their specialized mandibles. So you can't really see it in the picture, uh, but they've got uh, special uh, mandibles on the sides that are uh, serrated and they will chew off uh, pieces of leaf and, and use those to line their nest. And um, uh, they can nest in the ground, uh, but a lot of them will nest in small cavities in wood. So pretty interesting uh, bee there. This, this one here is a mining bee. Uh, um, these are also solitary ground nesting bees and they're usually dull brown or, or blackish in color. I think they're interesting because they are really, really hairy. And uh, uh, to me, it looks more like a, a fuzzy cat uh, in a way than it does a bee. If you, if you took the wings off of it, you'd almost think that was a mammal. Um, but uh, pretty interesting uh, insect there. Um, if, if Chris was on here, uh, he could tell us exactly uh, what this is before I ever say anything, but uh, um, butterflies and moths are another important group of insect pollinators. Uh, this one is a, a skipper. Uh, there's actually two of them in the picture. And I believe there's a, a third pollinator over here on the side. This is a purple cone flower uh, that they're working in. Uh, usually you see a lot of uh, bees on these. I, um, I've got a few of these in my garden and it's mostly uh, really large uh, bumblebees that I see uh, working these. But um, these are Dakota skippers and it's a, a male and a female. Uh, so the, it's not two different species, it's the, the same species on the same flower. <clears throat> And this one is a red admiral butterfly that is uh, feeding on milkweed. I, I believe that's uh, common milkweed uh, that it's on. Um, this one is an eastern tiger swallowtail and uh, it's got a really long uh, uh, proboscis uh, that you can just see. Uh, if you can see my cursor, uh, it kind of uncurls it and uh, that enables it to go down in really deep flowers. A lot of times you'll see butterflies sitting in one place and they'll just move around from one flower to the next with their proboscis without uh, relocating. And it's basically a, a straw, a built-in straw uh, that they use to suck the, the nectar out of the flowers. <clears throat> um, I actually got to see one of these um, last year, and I think that's the first time that I had seen one in my yard, uh, but these are uh, sphingid moths, and uh, this is again on common milkweed, and they're sometimes called hummingbird moths because they can hover like a, a, a hummingbird uh, when they're collecting the nectar uh, with their uh, proboscis, which you can see very well in this photo, and uh, it's, you can, they, they make a sound when they're hovering that in some ways would remind you of a hummingbird. It, it's kind of loud. Uh, they're very conspicuous uh, when they're working the flowers. And um, this is on milkweed, but I actually had them uh, working my blueberries. And uh, that, that's how I saw them, but uh, pretty neat uh, pollinated. 
Now, this next one, a lot of times people will see these, uh, my wife in particular, and she thinks that anything that is yellow and black is a, uh, a bee. And so when she sees these, uh, she starts to swat and, and squall. She, she doesn't like to have them around. And a lot of times they, they like to come and uh, gather salt uh, off of your arm if you're sitting on the porch or something. But uh, this is a, a hoverfly and um, it doesn't bite or sting, um, but it uses its resemblance to a bee or a wasp. Um, and I, I think it's to kind of, uh, it's a, a protection mechanism. Uh, it's kind of um, adapted to, uh, to bluff some of its, na its natural enemies. And uh, there's several different types of hoverflies. So this is just one type. Um, you know, some are, are bigger and um, they're all in the same family. Um, there's one that my grandfather called a news bee that uh, you would think was a hornet. Um, but it, it's got this same shape. And I think people, when they see that tapered abdomen, they think that that's, uh, you know, that there's got to be a stinger there, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't sting at all. And if you'll notice, um, they only have two wings uh, and this is in the family Diptera. Uh, so unlike our, our true bees that have four, uh, there's only two here. And um, the hind wings are reduced to a pair of small structures called uh, Halter, halterers. Uh, and um, so that, that name diptera obviously means two. And it's, um, this is another one that's adapted to feeding on flowers. And um, so, but it's not limited to just these, even mosquitoes. We don't think about mosquitoes uh, pollinating things, but even uh, mosquitoes will feed on flowers and occasionally uh, get the nectar out as an energy source. So um, they're not just blood suckers. Uh, they, they do work flowers as well. Um, okay, this is just another picture of a, a hoverfly uh, proving uh, <laughs> that they're pollinators. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know what kind of flower that is. It's very pretty, um, but that, that's a um, hoverfly. This next one is a, a beetle. Sometimes we don't think about beetles being pollinators, uh, but uh, beetles are the most diverse group of insects. There's millions of species worldwide, and a lot of these are very highly uh, adapted to feeding on flowers. And this particular one is a soldier beetle. And if you have gardened, you're almost uh, guaranteed to have seen this particular beetle before. Uh, they're very, very common in mid to late summer. and Again, I've seen these on um, uh, mints. Uh, they, they love uh, my mint flowers, uh, but I've also seen them on um, marigolds and uh, they, they're not specialists. They will go to a lot of different types of flower. Um, this one is a longhorn beetle and uh, you can pretty well figure out why it has that name. Those two antennae that it have uh, look like two big long horns. And uh, this is a, a male uh, valley elderberry long uh, horn beetle. So kind of a, a mouthful, but I'm assuming by the elderberry that it, it uh, tends to work elderberry plants. And uh, so that's really important if you like elderberries or elderberry wine or jelly. This is a picture of wasps and hornets uh, that provision their nests with other insects to feed their young, but they also uh, regularly collect uh, nectar. And uh, these are tarantula wasps. Uh, their bodies are usually uh, less hairy than bees. Um, I think if you're familiar with the, the native wasps that we have, uh, they tend to be really slick and shiny. And um, um, they're, they're usually less effective pollinators, but uh, that doesn't mean that they uh, uh, don't have the interest. Um, these little uh, black ones, um, I'm not sure exactly what kind they are, but uh, we've got these uh, here as well. And um, um, I think it was the mint. I had some um, hoary mountain mint and these things were just all over it. Uh, and they stayed on it. As long as it had blooms, uh, you could go there any day 
just about and find uh, these, these wasps. So as far as pollinator conservation, now that we know how important they are and, and all the different ones that, uh, all the different insects and things that will pollinate, um, what do pollinators need? So for food, they need nectar and pollen and a uh, food source uh, for their larvae. And uh, they need nesting sites. Sometimes this will be uh, sandy uh, places uh, in the ground. Uh, sometimes it's the little tubes, the little bamboo or, or uh, drilled out places uh, that I told you about. Uh, they need overwintering sites. And uh, you know, sometimes that can be in the bark of trees like a shag bark or a scaly bark hickory, uh, but they just need some place to spend the winter. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our pollinators are in decline and I'm sure this isn't news to you all. You've probably heard um, that uh, that's a significant issue and it's not just with our wild uh, bees, uh, though they're heavily affected as well. Even our domesticated honeybees uh, the ones that we, in theory, spend the most of our time uh, trying to uh, benefit, and uh, we spend a lot of uh, energy and effort caring for them, uh, even they have struggled uh, as of late. And a lot of this is due to habitat loss and fragmentation. So as we develop places, uh, you know, new subdivisions go in, new shopping malls, roads are built. Every time we do that, it's chopping up, uh, slicing and dicing their habitat. And, you know, if you think about it, if, if a bee is having to fly across uh, Interstate 81 uh, to get from one block of its uh, real estate to another, uh, there's tractor trailers and, uh, you know, it's, it's basically uh, having to uh, fly the gauntlet to get from one side to the other. And so you're gonna lose a lot of those bees uh, and, and butterflies and different things because of the elevation that they tend to fly at. And so uh, that, that habitat loss, the fragmentation is, is one thing. Invasive species have come in. And so this can be um, uh, plants that maybe are not uh, beneficial to them that tend to uh, uh, take over the habitat where their uh, uh, preferred uh, food sources would normally grow. And, um, you know, if you overwhelm the woods or the edge of the roads with garlic mustard, for example, and it crowds out everything else, uh, then you've lost habitat uh, for, for the species that these pollinators prefer. Um, obviously, we uh, are very dependent on pesticides uh, for our food supply. And uh, if we didn't have them, um, we would have probably half the food supply that we have. And that means, you know, Sometimes uh, I hear people, uh, and my mom is an example, that get really, really uh, anti-pesticide. And I, I appreciate that. But I, I told her, if half the food goes away, who gets to decide which half of the population starves to death? And uh, you know that's, that's the terms that we need to, to think in. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should be careless and if we uh, find out that a particular uh, family of pesticides is causing a problem, then we need to address that family of pesticides and try to go to something that is safer, uh, that will maybe do as good a job or will at least uh, provide an acceptable uh, level of control for the pest that we're trying to target. Um, one in particular that is always uh, in the hot seat is imidacloprid. And imidacloprid is one that is widely used. Um, it's used to control um, hemlock woolly adelgid to protect our hemlock trees from being lost. Uh, it's used in corn. Uh, it's, it's a broad spectrum insecticide and it is uh, systemic. That means the, the plants take it up and that means that it is in the nectar that they produce. So if a honeybee uh, flies in to feed on the nectar or the pollen of a plant that has been treated with imidacloprid, um, it's going to cause a problem. And so um, sometimes it's about uh, how we apply the pesticides. So if we know that they've got our, it's a contact pesticide, it has to actually hit the insect uh, to be able to kill it. And that after it's sprayed on the plant and it dries, it, then it no longer causes a problem. 
uh, and that's true for a lot of our pesticides, then it may mean just applying the pesticides really early in the morning or really late in the evening when our uh, honeybees and other pollinators maybe are not uh, working those flowers. And so uh, that's kind of a cultural approach. But uh, there are diseases that have been identified. I'm thinking about things like colony collapse disorder that have impacted our honeybees. And then of course there are parasites uh, that uh, attack them. So as far as what can you do to help pollinators, uh, planting a garden, a flower garden, or uh, even just a vegetable garden uh, is a great benefit to uh, pollinators. Um, I planted a little strip of sweet corn uh, this past year for the first time in, in several years. And it amazed me how many uh, honeybees were in the tassels of that corn. I knew they liked to work it. And corn is uh, primarily uh, pollinated by wind, uh, not by insects. But uh, the honeybees absolutely love the, uh, the pollen from sweet corn. So uh, that's a, an important thing. I know on tomatoes, uh, bees love to work, uh, and this would be uh, bumblebees in particular, but also honeybees will work the flowers of um, solanaceous crops. So your tomatoes um, would be one example of that. Um, but putting up bee nesting boxes. So um, uh, you, can, you can find that online pretty easy. Um, providing overwintering habitat. So it may mean that if you've got a rough edge around your yard or along a creek or along the woods, you know, don't weed eat everything down to the bare ground uh, just because you want it to look like it's had a buzz cut going into the winter. Uh, leave that stuff kind of rough and, and uh, that provides habitat uh, for, for pollinators, but other insects. I know um, uh, many times I've seen the, the, the uh, cocoons or uh, I guess that's the proper term for like a praying mantis. Uh, it's kind of a pithy, uh, brownish, tan, uh, a little gall looking thing. They love to, to lay those uh, along the, the edges of, of fields. So just leave that stuff. You don't have to, to kill everything. And limit your pesticide use. If you don't know that you absolutely have to spray, don't. Um, you know, some people uh, preemptively spray. And we never, as county agents, we never recommend that. Uh, we recommend uh, an integrated pest management approach, which is the pest has to not just be present, but actually be threatening uh, your crop. And it has to be threatening it at a level that warrants uh, putting a pesticide on. So just because you find one bad bug, uh, that doesn't mean that you nuke the entire garden uh, to try to eradicate all these mystery pests. Uh, wait until you know you have the problem. Uh, pollinator gardens are really, really good and choose plants that flower at different times of the year. You don't want a feast and famine situation where they've got a lot of flowers uh, for a very brief amount of time and then they have nothing. Uh, that's called a dearth um, or a drought. Uh, you want to have flowers that will bloom uh, steadily and so sometimes um, there are species of, of flower that will bloom all summer long. And I'm thinking of, uh, you know, your mints, your zinnias, uh, th those kinds of things. They will bloom throughout the entire summer. But in other situations, you might want to stagger plant uh, or plant, uh, I guess, a variety of species so that um, there's always uh, something in bloom that they like to work. And uh, it's usually better to plant in clumps rather than single plants. So if you just have one uh, purple coneflower or echinacea, uh, you know, that's kind of like putting uh, one uh, breakfast out. And um, they do have to eat lunch and dinner, so to speak. And so you need to have uh, other plants for them to go to. So it's better to plant in blocks. So if you can plant in a, a whole group of one species and then plant another block of another species, uh, that is useful to the pollinators. Use a lot of different colors and shapes. 
and that will benefit a lot of different pollinators uh, that may have a preference. Um, if you have a choice, native plants are always better uh, just because they're going to attract those native pollinators and they tend to be better sources of, of nectar and pollen and uh, they're also really, really important for a lot of the, the uh, caterpillars um, that we have. So I'm, I'm thinking about like the milkweed and the monarch butterflies. And, and speaking of which, uh, here, here's a, a photo uh, of uh, a monarch on um, milkweed and might be wrong, but I think that's swamp uh, milkweed. Um, this is a, a photo that is just showing the, the range of our monarchs and where they um, uh, have their, their spring and uh, summer uh, breeding areas and then where they go to uh, to overwinter. And it's really remarkable. All the monarchs from uh, the eastern uh, United States uh, funnel down to one little area in central Mexico. And um, I think I talked about this once before, uh, wanting very much to go down and to see this. And I, I found out that it's kind of in a very dangerous part of Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe I won't go after all. I don't want to be uh, putting myself in, in trouble, but it's a, a beautiful mountainous area, uh, really high elevation, and it's uh, um, uh, very moist so they don't dry out. And it seems like there's a lot of firs and, and just evergreen trees that help protect them uh, during the uh, winter uh, time of the year, but uh, pretty neat. And, and this is just a picture of how many of them will um, light on one tree. And uh, all of these uh, are monarch butterflies. And that's just phenomenal uh, to me. <clears throat> but there are groups that you can join. There's conservation societies uh, that specifically benefit uh, the, the butterflies. And I believe they um, plant flowers here in the United States, but there's also a group that has been working to uh, protect this area uh, down in Mexico because it's so very important uh, to the monarchs. Um, but uh, as far as here in the United States, uh, planting milkweeds obviously is really, really important and farmers in particular do not like milkweed uh, because they tend to spread and um, uh, they, they cause problems uh, for, for livestock and such and uh, interfere with pastures, I guess, and so they want them gone. Uh, but if you've got this growing along your fence, uh, leave it, let it grow. And uh, the, the caterpillars feed on it, but it also provides habitat for other, uh, other animals. Um, they, they really smell good. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to the blooms of a, uh, a milkweed, but it's got a really, really uh, wonderful uh, kind of a lilac uh, smell to it. So uh, I think it's a great plant to have. And um, that, that's it. Uh, do we have any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat box if you're uh, bashful. We do have a, a special thing for everybody that participated tonight. I don't know uh, where you're checking in from, uh, but if um, we don't want to breach anybody's um, confidentiality or, or uh, their privacy, but uh, I'm going to uh, put my email address uh, in the chat box. And Phil and Jeremy, if you all wouldn't mind doing the same, uh, anybody that participated tonight, um, we have each of the three counties has a pretty good supply of pollinator seed. So we've got a lot of zinnias and, and wildflower seed, and uh, we can uh, have you come pick those up and um, uh, if, if it's somebody that maybe Phil already has the contact information on, you don't have to, uh, to provide that again. But if, if you want to email us uh, your contact information, if you're new to this, uh, you can send that to us. And um, um, I know if, 
if Phil and Jeremy can, I don't mind a bit mailing you uh, some packets of the, the pollinator seed. Uh, so it's, it's whatever works for you. You can go by your local uh, extension office and, and pick it up, uh, or you can uh, check with us and we'll mail it to you. Thank you all. And I, I hope that uh, you will take advantage of the pollinator seed. And uh, I'm sure you've already got a place in mind. Um, we, we planted, uh, thanks to Chris uh, last year, talking about um, the zinnias. Um, our county uh, asked us to plant um, a pollinator uh, plot up at Fish Pond Lake um, near Jenkins. And we took our tractor and I think it was maybe a, an eighth of an acre total that we uh, tilled up and planted. And it became uh, the focal point of the entire uh, area. And uh, we had folks that came in and uh, took uh, photos in front of the flowers. They, they cut the flowers and took them home uh, to put in vases. And of course that didn't affect the zinnias. There were so many of them, they actually, uh, it helped them. They bloomed more and so uh, they bloomed all summer long, and um, uh, I, I, I want to thank Chris uh, for suggesting those in his talk last time because uh, that made me a hero uh, to folks in Letcher County, and, and I'll take all that I can get. Um, <laughs> as far as the, uh, was that you, Chris? Yeah, I'm just uh, chuckling there. <laughs> yeah, for, for, the mo for the money that you spend, uh, the zinnias are still the best investment. And if you just want one simple thing put in, um, I was noting uh, recently, I've seen some things, mountain mint mm -hmm. may be the number one plant in terms of native plants to put in your garden to attract the widest variety of pollinators. Uh, I heard a talk uh, not too long ago. And they were claiming they have more different species of pollinators on mountain mint, the native mint and the other. So that's another uh, good plant to include. And if you're vegetable gardening, especially if you're doing herbs, uh, dill, chives, oregano, leeks, let some of those bloom. They do a wonderful job of bringing in uh, pollinators, at least in my garden. I find all kinds of butterflies, bees, and flies from uh, letting my, my herbs bloom. So those are some other things to think about. The, the mint and the oregano, um, they will blow you away with the number of things that come to them. And probably the only thing I would say is that nobody has just a little bit of mint. If you, <laughs> if you plant one mint plant uh, in a very short amount of time, you will have a lot of mint. And uh, you know that's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, but one, uh, another one I was gonna suggest is sage. If you've never let that one go to bloom, it's got a wonderful poop, uh, purple flower on it uh, that the, the bees love. And uh, lavender is another one that they, they really like to visit. The, the only grip, the gripe to the lavender is that it has a, a pretty narrow uh, bloom time. And uh, the oregano that you mentioned and uh, your uh, bee balm, those kinds of things, um, those bloom on and on and on. And uh, so the, the, they provide more benefit. The, as far as the scientific name, um, the one that, that I grew was Hori Mountain Mint. And um, I don't know what the genus and species, um, Phil, you're the plant man. What's, what's our... I am uh, putting the, the genus in the chat box. And I did have to look that up. I, I, I didn't off the top of my head, but I found a, uh, I think it was Clemson um, thing I just pulled up. It said there are 11 mints that are considered mountain mints. And I think the Hoary Mountain Mint and some of the others would be in the same genus. Um, and I know we've got a doctor on here tonight, so I'm not making any medical uh, recommendations, but I will say that mint has long been credited. Uh, as a, um, a stomach comfort for folks that have stomach digestive uh, type problems. And uh, I know that's why I initially planted the, the mint 
uh, it's a calming, uh, I, I'm assuming it's some kind of anti-inflammatory type thing, but uh, uh, the, the mints are great for us as well as the, the pollinators. As far as preparing the, uh, the site for the seeds, um, when we planted up at Fish Pond, we, we had a rototiller and we um, just rototilled it. Uh, but I don't know that that's entirely necessary. Uh, I think if you just disked it, uh, mint seed is very small. So you don't want to, um, you don't want to plant it deep. That's one that you just kind of scattered on the surface. And if a rain comes, the, as long as it's got contact with the soil, uh, that's all it really needs. Um, so you, you don't have to go to extreme measures. If it's got a, a dense um, uh, thatch or if, you know, obviously if you're planting it into fescue or something, you would have to uh, uh, spray to kill those things uh, down so that you would have that bare uh, soil. Did we get all the questions? Okay. Well, thank you all for tuning in tonight. And I hope that everybody that participates uh, uh, makes it a point to give us your contact information to get the seed and uh, do us a favor. If you plant these and uh, you end up having uh, pollinators and uh, that kind of thing, visiting these during the course of the summer, uh, send those uh, pictures to us uh, so that we know that you have uh, taken advantage of it and uh, uh, you might even be in the newsletter or something if, if, uh, if we have a good picture. Uh, and I know Phil has those uh, fabulous Five Point Fridays or whatever they're called. Is it, is it Five Point Friday? Yes. yes. There's no fabulous in it. It's just Five Point. Oh, there might be now. I may, I may add that. <laughs> they, they are fabulous and famous. I like them myself. There's, I will tell you, there's very few county agent newsletters that I read because it's usually stuff that I've already seen. But when I see those come out on Friday, I, I make it a point to read them. Uh, so you do a great job with that, Phil. Appreciate it. And thanks for the uh, excellent presentation this evening. I enjoyed it. Very good. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. Well, there's still a little sunlight at my house and that and it's springtime and it's pretty weather and uh, it's supposed to be nasty tomorrow. So I'm going to cut you loose. Uh, go enjoy the, the nice uh, evening and uh, hopefully we will see you on uh, Thursday. What, what's the talk on Thursday? Thursday, we have Hemlock Woolley Adelgid uh, uh, with Dr. Ellen Crocker from the University of Kentucky. Should be a great uh, presentation. So come back and join us. Very good. Hope to see you all then.